Next up is I, I, it always weird for me when uh, when people like fr friends like David talk to me in in, in French. Um, <laughs> we have a data scientist next who actually coined the term data scientist. He's at uh, Greylock Partners. He has a, a very good talk, I thought, um, and he's uh, coming from California. DJ Patil. Great. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, when I, when Louis and I f was first talking about the Internet of Things, like what does that that really mean? The 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 thing that struck me the most was really as a guy who works with a lot of data is it's really about the data of things. And the reason I say that is as we really kind of start first. What we've heard over the last few days is really this, this internet of things. What is, what is this internet of things? And to me, the real thing and the power about the, everything that you're interacting is, is that they produce data. They produce a tremendous amount of data. And one of the ways to think about that is just let's just go through a few examples of what we mean when we do say an internet of things. And some of the ones that you've heard about early today you know, the most obvious one is the one that's in your lap or in your pocket. It's the tablet, it's the phone, it's all of the things that we're used to interacting with. But there's more, there's things that are on our wrists now, like this is the Nike Fuel or the, the Fitbit that you're gonna hear more about or, or just recently released is this uh, Jawbone Up. And what these things do is they work to instrument you as a thing. They're starting to treat you, they're starting to treat me. Every one of us is a thing. It's turning us into an internet of things. And what's more as we start to think about that is consider this device. This is a Zio. And the Zio is, it measures your sleep. It tells you if you're having REM sleep, light sleep, deep sleep. And I'll talk a little bit more about it. But the goal is to actually understand how you are progressing through a place where we'd like to spend majority of our life in bed, in sleep. But what's more is you think about these things, like what's the first thing that happens when you go to a physician's office? You go to the doctor, you're feeling sick, what's the first thing they do? They put a thermometer in your mouth and they're gonna put this blood cuff on your arm, blood pressure cuff on your arm. Why? Because they want some data about you to understand if you're sick or not. So what's amazing and what's interesting for me is now you can use these devices, this is the why things blood pressure cuff, and you can take your blood pressure anytime you like. The part that's interesting is for me and many other people, for whatever reason, we have something called white coat syndrome, where our blood pressure is higher just by the mere fact that we're in a doctor's office. What this device allows me to do is be able to kind of sit there and, and, and in my home and get my measurements and be able to track it and then show the doctor how I'm doing. Now there's one that's just about to be released. This is called a Live Core. It's a little pad that, uh, attachment that goes on your iPhone. It gives you the same quality heart rate readings that you'd get in a very sophisticated lab. So you actually know how you're performing. And so what I'd argue is what really is happening is we're thinking about our world as an instrumented life cycle. From the time we're born all the way as we progress through life, starting to instrument ourselves. We are becoming the internet of things. And what we're really aiming for here is a combination where we're blending sensors, data, and the goal is to get data and insights. But most of the things that we're talking about so far here have been on the smaller side. They're sort of really small th things. What happens is we start to expand our thought process. Well, we have the, what Tony was talking about to kick off things with the Nest, but it doesn't just stop there. It's about everything that moves. The Google car is an internet of things. It's a wired instrument that can crush you, can hopefully keep you on the road, keep you safe. It's an internet of things. But also, millions of miles away, we have something operating on the surface of Mars that's, being, that's, that's working in an inhospitable environment, giving us information, helping us understand things in a totally new way. But it can go even bigger, right? One of the things is, consider this, the airline, right? A jet plane. Well, what is that what it means that it moves? Right now, we expect to have about, we're about 20,000 uh, operating aircraft right now. That's 43,000 43, engines. 
we're going to expect to add 30,000 more engines over the next 15 years. One of those engines, this is a new latest engine out of GE, General Electric. This is the, uh, uh, it's a new type of uh, engine. And what's amazing about this engine is, I mean, if I was bringing it on stage, it'd be giant. And, and I mean, I, if I was holding up my hand, I'd barely get to the middle of it. But this thing has 18 blades. It spins at this incredible 1,000 feet per second. But the amazing thing about the engine is it's got 4,000 4, parts. And the cool thing about this is it's sending off data. Just like that blood cuff monitor, just like that sleep, how it starts to tell you if you're sick, this engine tells the pilot, tells the plane, tells the mechanic if it's starting to get sick because it's throwing off so much data. The engine in itself is the Internet of Things. And finally, I'll let me add this, is, is if we think about what are these engines doing, they're trying to start saving fuel, they're trying to be more efficient, trying to be more productive. You add, you save 1% on fuel, you're getting about 30 billion over the next 50, 15 years. Think about railroads, locomotives. You know, as we think about all these things that are connected, you're talking about $32 trillion that can be affected by these Internet of Things over the next 15 years. One of the things that's really interesting thinking about railroads is that we have to think of it in the context of the network. It's not just the fact that it's a device in itself. It's over all this thing. And as you start to realize about that, Internet of Things is not just about the things. It's about processes. Give you a sense of that, consider this. This is the inside of Fukushima, the Fukushima reactor. This is the control room. You noticing anything interesting about this control room? Is that the control room you really want? Because when I think about a control room, that's what I think of a control room. That's NASA's control room for operating, right? It's not this kind of thing that looks like out of the 60s, where you need tons and tons of data. In 2003, there was a big blackout in the United States. It took out about eight states and part of Canada. And so what you see on the left is satellite imagery, uh, or on the, uh, the before is satellite imagery, before it, after it, so you have to see how much light difference there was. The amazing thing about this is they couldn't really figure out where the problem was, because one of the things that was a big issue was where's stuff actually going wrong? They did, couldn't figure it out. And so what they actually had, it, it took them several days to really start getting power back up, because they didn't know how everything was instrumented, how things were connected, and how things were working. And so we have to start thinking of this process. And so, what we're really aimed for is the sensors plus data equals insights. And one of the things I think we have to ask ourselves is how we're doing on a report card scale. How are we actually thinking about ourselves in terms of our progress? So on sensors, they're getting smaller, they're getting faster, they're doing better. We really got this unique way of giving things. Definitely a B plus. On data, we get an A. Got new ways to process data, massive insights. But when it comes down to creating insights and action, we really got to give ourselves a D. We're not really moving to insights and action. We're just creating a lot of data, a lot of data vomit. What we have to start doing is making an action. I'll give you a sense of this. This is my Zio output from my own sleep. You'll notice in there, you'll see how well I sleep, about three hours, 48, uh, 38 minutes, four hours, six hours, five hours. So this tells me a phenomenal insight. I sleep like crap. I didn't need a device to tell me I sleep like crap. I know that. Now, here's what's fascinating. So as a data scientist, I look at this data. If I parse through my data, what I know is within the first three hours of sleep, I must sleep between 55 minutes and an hour and five minutes of deep sleep. If I do not get that in one contiguous cycle, my sleep is going to be screwed up for the rest of the day. If that happens over several successive days, I am going to get sick. And so what you're actually seeing here is a progression of me getting sicker but the system is not telling me I'm getting sick. What you need to have is a data scientist to tell you that. That's not acceptable. And so what we need to have is a three-step plan to really make progress. Step one, we really have to start thinking about how do we treat the best practices of user experience, user interaction. And I want to give you three rules of thumb that we use always when we think about building data products to create insights and action. Number one, what do you want me to take away? I see something. What do you want me to take away from it? Two, what do you want me to do? What action do you want me to do? What are you, what am I, what are you trying to tell me that my next step should be? 
And the third, which I think is the most important and the one we most often leave out when we talk, build any type of thing or work da- with data, is how do you feel? Do you feel excited? Do you feel paranoid? Do you feel angry? Do you feel inspired? Give you a sense of that. When we look at my sleep, zero d- d- sleep data, just to give you a sense, what do you want me to take away? I sleep like crap. Thanks, I already knew that. What do you want me to do? I have no idea. How do I feel overwhelmed? What we need to have stuff do is lead us to the next step. Part two of this is we need to make superpowers. Munjul is going to talk a little bit more about this later in the uh, conference about why we need superpowers. But let me kind of just talk about what I mean by this. When you take out that phone, iPhone, Android, maybe it's Windows phone, and you're sitting in traffic, and you pull up a figure out where the traffic is and how to route yourself around it, how do you feel? You feel good, right? When you look up a review and you actually know what to do, what do you do? You feel good. You feel like you've got a superpower. How do you know it's a superpower? When you take it away, you feel powerless. You don't feel as good. Give a sense of that. Think about one of the earliest superpowers that we've seen in this last decade. The financial calculator, the first time you had a financial calculator, what was that for an accountant? All of a sudden, they didn't just have to do arithmetic in their head or ledgers, they're able to do something. Excel, now a new power, it's, it's, or PowerPoint. These are new types of superpowers. The phone is similarly acting that way, and what we need is our internet of things to act like superpowers. Give me an example one, maybe you've seen this guy. He's pretending here to be a superhero. And so he's got the Google glasses on. So think about for a moment what that's like for him. You know, what Luik is really thinking in his head is he's thinking like he's this guy. He's got a heads up display, he's got Jarvis, it's talking to him great. So how does Luik really feel? You know, you know what's going on in his head? He's this guy. All right, he's feeling pretty good about himself. It empowers you to see the world different, to in- interact with the world in a very new, different way. And the thing that's really empowering about thinking about things this way is what it enables you to drive for building new products. Because what we're trying to do there is identify things that when we put them in your hand, give you new type of of ways of interacting with the world that you couldn't have otherwise. One of the lessons that I think is really critical about this is to use this term augmentation. We've been building things, and some of you have heard of these provocative statements such as, we're just going to replace the physicians with all these data products or this new technologies. What the word I'd like you to think about is augmentation. We're not out to replace things. And if you're building an internet of things or building any type of thing with data, you've got to think augmentation, not replacement. Let's look back at one of the things of highlights of science fiction, which I think attributes this. It's Star Trek. So you've got Spock, arguably probably the real best data scientist in the world. What's he do? When he lands on the planet, he pulls out his tricorder, right? Starts looking at things. Does a tricorder tell him exactly what to think? No, it gives him a bunch of data that he interprets. The same way when Curiosity is out there on Mars, it's not telling you what's happening. It's sending data back to the scientists to make them more efficient so they can understand what's happening. The same way when McCoy sits there and waves that little thing over the patient and is trying to figure out what's going wrong with them, what's happening? You know, it's sitting there going, woo, 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 woo. It doesn't actually say, oh, you're sick. What it's doing is it's making McCoy feel efficient. It's augmenting the physician to be smarter. So when you're wearing these devices, whether it's a Fitbit, a Fuel, or these type of things, you have to ask yourselves, how is it augmenting us? How is it making a superpower for us? Rather than trying to replace some experience directly, it augments it. And finally, part three of this, which I think is really needed, is we have to start thinking of this as a new set of skills. Because what comes together so far is we've now seen this remarkable power of sensors. What does it mean to make a sensor? You need new ways to think about hardware, new ways to think about physics, you need chemistry, you need all of these different aspects. But then you've also got to have the data, which requires a different form of engineering, different ways of moving data, cloud, all these different things. And then finally, we have to have the data scientists who are helping actually make insights and the the actions you're supposed to take because of the data come alive 
and treat it in a new way. And so when those things come together, what I think we need to have is what I'd call a data scientist 2.0. A new type of training, a new type of individual. These people are those that are going to understand the hardware, that are going to understand the math, they're going to understand the physics, they're going to understand the chemistry, and they're going to really, most of all, understand how to put the human back in the loop of data. For Internet of Things, really putting the human back in touch with how we actually think about the product life cycle and how this is going to aid you as an individual or an organization, or through a process. And so as we start to really think about that, what I'd like to leave you with is to really think about this, not just as the internet of things, but the data of things, the hardware of things, all of the things that are necessary to really make a product come to life and add as a superpower to make your lives better. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. That was cool. So can you, uh, when do we get the uh, upload into my brain, a new skill set feature? It's already there. Ah. <laughs> you just don't realize. I, you know, I think what the, the, the crazy thing is the speed and progression of these technologies. And I think it's just going to be, uh, uh, what's the remarkable is that conferences like this are bringing that kind of unique group of people together to, to make that next wave of innovation happen. Well, that was a great talk. Thank you so much, DJ. And you can follow uh, DJ at, at Dpatil. Yep. D-P-A-T-I-L. That's right. And you should meet him too. He's super, <laughs> super cool guy. Great. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. <laughs>